of his people. When we begin to praise him, it's almost like he, 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 he sets his throne right smack dab, right in the middle of our praises. He inhabits it. We were born, we were created and designed to worship him with everything of who we are. Every, every, we, that's us. That's what we're supposed to do. We were created to worship him. Somehow, society has messed all of this up. Somehow, society has told us that we need to, that we need to uh, make lots of money, and, 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 uh, and, which that's not a bad thing. Money's not evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. But somehow, we got our priorities all mixed up. We were designed and created to worship Him and to honor Him with everything of who we are. Jesus, we love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Church, you can be seated if you can. I want to speak to you this morning. Um, Something that I that I feel like we're we go through, something that, that holds us back. And that's the bondage of fear. Fear. Fear is a bondage. It keeps us from doing things that God has asked us to do. Now, the Holy Spirit provides courage for us to do what God's called us to do. So really, in a, in a, in a roundabout way, if you want to have that boldness and, and to be that witness that God's called you to be, you, need the, you really need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what we need right there. That's what we, we need to be seeking, for sure. And we do that, and we, and, and we receive the Holy Spirit by seeking Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the baptizer. Now, this is not necessarily a, a sermon on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week. We talked about re revival. We talked about uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But, but th this is one thing that keeps us from receiving what God wants us to receive, and that is fear. Fear entangles us. It restricts us. It's almost like a straitjacket that keeps us from moving, it, it, uh, being in a straitjacket in a, in a padded room with a locked door. How many has ever been there? Don't admit that. <laughs> I saw a few hands go up. No, I didn't. <laughs> we get so wrapped up in fear that we allow fear to overcome us and hold us back. Now, my wife tells a story a lot of times when she was a little girl how would you probably be 12 or so, or I'm not for sure, but she would, she, don't, she has no idea what story I'm about to tell. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're saying. <laughs> but she tells a story. Now, they lived way out in the boondocks, okay? They lived way out in the country, and, and there was nobody for, you know, pretty good ways away. And, and, <clears throat> and it was dark outside. But she would always have to either, if, if she was taking the trash out or if she was taking the scraps out or whatever she was doing, it, if, when it was dark outside, she was scared. Just like probably any one of us would be. But here she was probably, how old were you? 12, 13 years old. And she had a little sister named Rebecca. And Rebecca was just a baby. She's nine years older. So Rebecca was probably three, two or three or four years old, however old she was at that time. It gave Rochelle courage to pick up her baby sister to go outside. I don't know what she thought her baby sister was going to do for her if she got attacked or somebody came after her or whatever. But it gave her all the courage in the world to hold her baby sister and walk outside and she could do whatever because, I, I don't know, maybe something swelled up on the inside of her that 
she was now the protector. I don't know. But we all get scared. Fear. And there's different types of fear. There's, or, there's fear in different ways. Now, there's a fear of, you know, after and you watch something spooky or something spooky on television or whatever, and, and you, you have that fear. And, 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 you know, when you was a kid and you watched something scary and then you were the last one up and you had to turn the light out and run to the bed, you know. And, uh, and, and run and then just hide. And somehow, somehow if you got your covers over your head, uh, you were protected. Nothing was going to get through those covers at all. <laughs> and you made sure that your foot was not off the, off the side of the bed, lest anything come up from underneath it and grab your foot and jerk you up underneath. You stayed right there in the center to where if something was underneath you, you, they would have to reach far across the bed to pull you off the bed. And <laughs> oh, man. Well, well, we get scared. There's a lot of things that bring fear in our life. Um, goodness, money or the lack of <laughs> brings fear in our life. A lot of things. Your retirement. You're not worth as much as what you used to be. Maybe the stock market. You know, maybe your, your 401k is now to 201. <laughs> it dropped a couple. <laughs> Terrorism. Oh, that strikes fear in people. ISIS. Man, people just, they're, they're afraid of what's going to take place. All these shootings that are taking place. The fear of losing your freedom, you know, with politicians threatening to remove several certain freedoms away from you. you, you we, we, get so, we get so fearful of the future. We think that, how in the world can we do this? Man. War. What's going to take place? Fear of what? There's all kinds of fear. All kinds of fear. David put these in the words into words in Psalms chapter 55, one through eight, and and, and I want this to be. Uh, I want this to resonate inside of you this morning. I, I want to, let's read this Psalm 55. One through eight, it says, listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy, at the snares of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revel me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. Is that a, is, is, you know what he's saying there? He's so overwhelmed with fear, he just feels like running away. How many of you ever felt like running away? Oh, God. And calling it quits. Just because of fear. I'm telling you, fear is one thing the enemy can trap you in. Some people are afraid of getting in too deep with God. Afraid of failing. You're afraid of not going to be good enough. The enemy has his finger of condemnation upon you of your past experiences, of your past life, of what you used to be involved in. And he's constantly bringing that up to your memory of, of who you used to be and not what you are now. And God is saying it doesn't matter necessarily what you used to be. What's in your past is in your past. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're a new creature. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let him, don't, don't, don't settle for second best with God. 
God has got all. He, God's got everything that you need. Turn to him in your time of fear. Turn to him in your time of doubt. Man, why do we give in to fear? And we, we live in a very fearful society. Some of you probably remember another fear. You know, in a day and age that we live in now, we're so uncertain. I mean, my goodness, uh, you know, we're to the point now that we, we don't look at the American dream like we used to. I, I remember when I was a teenager, you know, I, I very well believed that, that in, in the American dream, you know, I never thought that the United States would be to the point of where it is today at a crossroads of, of being in direct judgment with God. Turning, they've, they've turned their very back upon God. And they've turned it on Israel as, as well. But friend, and that's a whole, well, that's the same story, different chapter though. Because the enemy of Israel is an enemy of God. And friend, right now we are flirting with death. America is flirting with death, and we've got to get over this fear of ISIS and, and, and all of these uh, uh, Islam, and we've got to get over that because God, our God, is greater. Amen. Greater is he who is in me than he that's in the world. I don't care what ISIS does. I don't care what radical Islam... If, you want to know my point, and I'm telling, and, and anybody that listens on YouTube on this, all five people that look at it on YouTube, <laughs> it's all radical. That's part of their makeup. If nobody's going to say it, I'm going to say it. Islam is all radical. It's part of their Koran. You realize that it's even, it's actually even okay for them to lie to an infidel. You realize that? It's okay, according to the Koran. It's okay. It's not punishable. It's not a sin, per se, using it in our context, for them to lie to an infidel. And we are infidels. And the agreements that they're making right now, it's okay because it's all a part of jihad. We need to pray for them. We need to get down on our knees and seek God. Turn from our wicked ways. Pray. Amen. That's the only way that our land is going to be healed. And our country is going to turn around. But we live in that fear. We live in that fear of the uncertainties. Perhaps some of you that lived through the uh, World War II or, or Korean War or whatever war you remember the times maybe maybe there was uncertain times then that, that was obviously before my time but perhaps you had probably some of the same fears about the world as many people do we, we you know we don't know our future we don't and so we're, we're afraid people many people are living in fear today I'm here to tell you God this is not issued by God God doesn't bring us fear. The absence of God does bring about fear. Kind of like the difference between darkness and light. Darkness is not, I know I've said this to you before, but I want to drill this home to you today. Darkness is not a substance. Light is a substance. Darkness and night, I mean darkness and, and, and light or are not uh, necessarily opposites per se. Darkness is not a substance. Darkness is the absence of light. You can't turn on a dark bulb and bring darkness in the light room. You turn on a light, which is substance, into a dark room and it brings light. You have to take away the light to bring about darkness. The devil is nothing. He's nobody compared to Jesus. But he will take you to school and whip your tail if you don't have Jesus with you. I'm just putting it in layman's terms right here. He'll whip your tail, man. 
You think that you're big bad to try to go against the enemy and, and try, to do, try, to, try to fight the... Uh, you know what we try to do in life? We try to fight the enemy. Sometimes many people try to fight the enemy, try, try to fight Satan without God. They want to be good, moral people. Mm. And that's all fine and dandy. But just being good and moral is, is not enough. Good works won't get you to heaven. It's a relationship with God. But we try to do things. We try to fight spiritual battles without spiritual wars, uh, 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 without spiritual tools, and that gets us in trouble. And then we get discouraged and we think that God's not real. Well, it's because you're not fighting with the right tools. You're not fighting with the right weapons. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You bring a gun to a gunfight. You don't really bring a knife to a... You don't bring a knife to a knife fight either. You bring a gun to a knife fight. If you, oh, edit that out. I don't know. Uh, I'm just being. Mm. <laughs> I'm pro Second Amendment, friends. Protect yourselves. Just don't live in fear. Don't live in it. So we're talking about fear today. God does not want us to be fearful. And in his word, in the word of God, he brings an antidote. He brings a remedy to fear. So what can I do when I feel fearful? What can I do when I feel, feel fearful? First of all, we need to do this. Cast your burdens on the Lord. Because he cares for you. He desires to know. He, you know what? He already knows. He wants to hear it from your lips. He wants you to give it to him. He's not going to reach out. Those of you that are sitting in this place today and you've got fear inside of you in some area, some part of your life, it may be finances, it might be in your marriage, it might be whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you need to cast that care upon him. You know something? A lot of times what I think and I'll preach a sermon on this sometime a lot of times what I think that people are praying for it's not necessarily a, a prayer list it's a wish list Lord I just I wish you would do this and we don't think any more about it that's not casting our cares upon him that's just showing God a wish list. We don't need to have a wish list of our prayer. Cast. You know, what that, what's that word cast mean? For, for any of you fishermen in here, those of you that are fishermen, you cast a line. So you reel that reel in. You, 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 get the, you have the little sinker or the, and the floater or the bobber, and you, know, you have your, your bait on the end of the hook there, and, and you... Hold that little button in and, you, and you, just, you just flick that pole and let go of the button and that line cast it. There's some distance there. And, it, and, and however hard you throw it is however far that line will go out into the water. We all know that. We're not silly, I know. But that's what casting is. I'm afraid many times what we do is we present the wish list. Boy, I sure wish that Lord would take care of this. But then we're still carrying around the weight and the heaviness of our care. It's like we go to the altar and we give it to God, but then when we get up off the altar, we're still carrying that. And God's saying, you know what? Leave it with me. I've got this. I've got your back. I want this. Give it to me. Psalm 55, verse 22, it says this, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Friends, let me tell you something today. 
You may have prayed about something in your life and things may or may not have gotten any better or they may have gotten better in some sense, but you still had to go through a a trying time in your life. Uh, Friends, I don't know why God chooses to do the things that he does. I don't know why sometimes God heals some people instantly, miraculously, and sometimes and, and others it takes treatment and doctors and all this stuff. But I'm, I'm gonna tell you this: God uses doctors to heal as well. Just because you go to a doctor does not mean that you have less faith in you. We're going to believe in the healing power. When we lay hands upon you, we're going to believe in the healing power. But, but don't, don't, don't start second-guessing yourself that just because you have to go to a doctor that you have less faith and, 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 and that it's not a healing from God because God gave those doctors that knowledge. If that was the case, then that means every doctor and every nurse, every medical person would be living in sin, if that was the case, if God didn't mean for us to use doctors and nurses in medicine. Our son is on a medicine right now that he'll probably, unless God heals him, he'll be on on that medicine the rest of his life. And we're believing for a healing. That doctor in, in, in San Francisco that Caden and I will be going to in, in January says that probably within the, next five to, uh, within the next five to 15 years, which that was three or four years ago when he said that, said within five to 15 years there, there should be a cure for narcolepsy. And they said definitely in Caden's lifetime. And I'm believing for a healing. This little French doctor that we go to, that's world renowned, he's the guru of narcolepsy. You know what we're praying? We're praying that Caden will be healed and it's going to be the shot heard around the world. Because as of right now, there is no cure for narcolepsy. There's no way that hypocretin can grow back into the hypothalamus. No way. None. And we're believing for a healing in such a way that that doctor is going to say, you know something? Something just took place here that I can't explain why. This must be divine intervention. That's what we're praying for. And that's going to be the shot heard around the world. And, and, and many of you have circumstances that you're praying like that as well. Cast your burdens to the Lord. Cast your cares on Him. The promise What's going to happen when we do this? What's going to happen when we cast our cares upon him? First of all, the the promise, there's going to be a promise that he's going to sustain us. That he's going to hold you up, that he's going to keep you in place, that he's going to make sure that you have the nourishment that you need. That's what we're promised. He's going to take care of us. He said he'll never let the righteous fall. Amen. It doesn't mean that we're not going to go through some hard times. It doesn't mean that you're not going to face treatment. It doesn't mean that, you're, that, 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 you're, that at times you're not going to be financially strapped. Uh, it, it doesn't, but he's, not, he's going to keep you up. You stay faithful to God. You hold on to God. You cast your cares upon God. God's going to hold you up. He's going to sustain you, my friend. He's going to keep you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through a hard time, but he's going to keep you. Instead of walking around living in fear, we need to be living in joy and living in praise. Knowing that I don't know why I'm having to face the things that I'm facing. But all I know is I've got a creator that is going to keep me, that's going to hold me up, that's going to keep me tight. He's going to provide for me. It might be beans and cornbread. It might not be steak and baked potato. You know what? That may not be the provision that he provides. Another thing that we need to do when we feel fearful, 
So not only cast our burdens on the Lord, but we need to take refuge in him. Now, we hear on the news today, there's uh, there, uh, there a lot of refugees. What, what are these refugees doing? They're leaving the Middle East, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're finding refuge in another part of the country or in, in, in another country nearby. They're trying, they're, but they're leaving the place where they feel fearful, and they're running to a safe place. That is what God desires us to do. He desires us to leave our fears and run towards safety, run towards him. He's desiring us to take refuge in him. Psalm 27, 1 through 3, verse 5 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I want to read that again. The Lord is the light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Oh, God. When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Yes. Verse 5, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high up on a rock. Yes. Yes. Here David reminds us, that we have a safe place to go when we feel fearful. Yes. We have a safe place. Yes. We got to run to him. He's our, we're, we're refugees. We're running towards him. We're running towards that safe place. Amen. There's no other place that we can be. Amen. No other place. Amen. Friend, I'm just here to tell you today, run to God. Yes. If there's something in your life that is causing you to fear, that's causing you to doubt God, that's bigger than you, I'm telling you, cast your care upon him and run to Jesus. He's your safe place. Live for him. See, David here in this passage of Scripture, he describes the Lord as our light, our salvation, and he's... He's also our stronghold. And he describes what he's decided to do with, when fear strikes. He says, I'm going to remember that I have to go to that safe place. What do we do a lot of times when we fear? When we fear, one of the first things that happens is we begin to feel sorry for ourselves that we're afraid. And sometimes we begin to um, doubt any solution. Sometimes we gripe and complain. I don't know nobody's ever done that in here. We don't ever gripe and complain, do we? God longs and desires us to cast our cares upon him. He desires that when we're fearful, that we run to him. During storms, When it's raining outside and thundering and kind of scary outside, I've got this little girl named Lexi that wherever she is, if she's in her room by herself, she runs out and she will find someone who's bigger than her, and normally it's mama or daddy, and run to their lap and want to be held at times, when it's bad outside, because she's scared. She's real fearful of that. 
And she just likes to be held. And she feels safe in one of our arms. You know, she feels protected that as long as mom and dad are here, I'm okay. Friend, that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do to him. When we're in that state of fear and we don't know where the next paycheck's going to be, we don't know, we don't know, uh, it, it, we, it, even in our, our, our marriage, we don't know if we need to go get a divorce lawyer or if we can work it out and we're fearful. He wants us to run to him and cast our cares upon him. And you know what our, you know what our daddy will do? When we genuinely run to him and seek refuge in him, he's going to wrap his arms of love around us. And he's going to look at you in the face, spiritually speaking, and he's going to say, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'm going to bring you through this? And at that point in time, we've got an answer. We, we've, got a, we, we've, got a, uh, we've got to give a response. We either trust him or we don't trust him. I want to challenge you to trust God. I want to challenge you to put this in God's hands. Well, pastor, I've got bills to pay. I don't know what to do. And if I, if I, cast, all my, if I cast that care to God, does that mean that there's going to be a, uh, uh, an envelope full of $100 bills in the mail because of that? No, not necessarily. It could happen. It has happened. Sometimes it may be in the form of a job. Sometimes it may be in the form of the creditor canceling your debt. Kind of unlikely, but could happen and it has happened especially in the medical field how many of you have had doctors to just cancel that debt that you owed them I've heard that many many times it's God's blessing God desires he desires you to run to him I don't know why God chooses to do some things one way and then he does it a whole different way. But all I know is that as a child of God, I know that God is in control. He's sovereign. Yes. He is sovereign. There is nothing above him. Everything is below him. There is no authority higher than God. None whatsoever. There is nothing that can change circumstances like God can. And once again, I've already, I already know the end of the book, what the end of the book says. I already know that the weapons that the enemy uses against us are not going to prosper. Amen. Amen. So why would I not want to be on the winning team? Amen. Why would I want to be on the second place team? Why would I want to be on the team? Actually, why would I want to be, not even just second place, why would I want to be on the team that's not even going to finish? Our team is not only going to finish, but they're going to win. And that's God's team. With his star player, Jesus Christ. He holds the records and the leading score, the most assists, <laughs> the most rebounds there's not a there's not a record out there <laughs> that can that that's going to overcome the records that he's broken amen. amen we're on the winning team my friend will you bow your heads with me this morning thank you jesus